How's it going, everybody? Hudlamut back with some more Steins Gate. And uh, last time, we found out Suzaha's dad is Titter. But apparently not John Titter. Someone named Beryl Titter. We also found out that uh, Mayuri can't cook, and that makes me sad. That hurts my feelings. It's, it's, it's ex extremely ironic for how much she loves food. And it just hurts my heart a little bit. But to the more important matter... We're gonna hopefully find out who this Barrel Titter is, and uh, figure out if John's the imposter or if Barrel's the imposter. I I don't know. I don't know. Something something weird's going on here. But Suzaha is definitely from the future, so I'm very positive at least as far as that goes. So let's see where this goes in this episode. I open my eyes to a deep scarlet sky. I'm on my back, blind face up. The sky is vast, and the color ominous. I've never seen it like this before. Where am I? I sit up. Oh, what the heck? Oh! There is nothing here. A wasteland stretches to the horizon. Nothing but rocks and dust as far as the eye can see. No plants, no water, no sun, no moon, no warmth, no cold, not a single breath of wind. It looks like hell. A frozen world. It can't be Earth. Mars, I could believe. Why am I here? This must be a dream. I give up thinking about it and lie down again on the sand. I guess I'll wake up soon. I should just wait until then. I wait, but the dream shows no sign of ending. Have I ever had a dream this lucid before? There's a terrible ringing in my ears that keeps me awake. I realize that it's the sound of silence. My belongings are gone. I have no watch, no phone. The lack of motion numbs my sense of time. How long have I been lying here? It might have been only a second. It might have been three days. An epiphany. The concept of time is a human construct. The universe at large has no use for it. Time is a cage that we created to feel secure. Within its walls, we can forget our own insignificance. I'm thirsty. It hurts to breathe. This void is no place for a human. We're not strong enough to live in a world without time. Tears fill my eyes. What do they mean? I no longer know. I want to die. Yes. Let's die. But what is death? To be frozen in time? Time stopped for me long ago. How can I die in a world that is already dead? Everything inside me is crumbling away. Who am I? I can barely recall. My soul is melting into the void. Is someone there? Anyone? Something moves in the corner of my eye. Impossible. I try to move my eyes, but I've forgotten how. Found you, Okarin. Pleasant voice silences the buzzing in my ears. I just assumed it was Mayuri. It reminds me of who I am. Okabe Rentaro. This time, my eyes move. It is. There's a girl sitting on a nearby rock. I recognize her. My frozen brain comes alive. 
Her presence breathes new life into this dead world. Mayuri? My brain is still half asleep, and I cannot speak. It's Mayuri. Shina Mayuri. My oldest friend. She smiles at me, swinging her legs. This is the Earth, you know. Seventy million years ago. Some scary people sent you here in a time machine. This is a dream, right? Mayushi went looking for you and found ocarines from many, many world lines. You're one of many ocarines, and also the original. Mayushi is one of many Mayushis, and also the original. And now, Okarin and Mayushi are going to die here. What the frick? This is a dream. Right, Mayuri? But... I know that another Okarin and Mayushi will pick up where we left off. Seventy million years in the future. So everything's A-OK. -okay. This is a dream. <laughs> I jerk awake on top of the sofa. My body is drenched in sweat. Oh, it was a dream. I must have fallen asleep sometime around noon. What a horrible nightmare. I guess the threatening email I got is still weighing on my mind. Still, Mayeti had to save me? Even in a dream. That's unacceptable. I'm the one who saves her. That's the way it should be. Besides, Mayeti's not smart enough to talk about time travel like that. I sit up and look around the room. She's right where I expect to find her. Dude, she just freaking saved your life. Don't you dare say anything. In front of the TV, watching a Rynet Kakadu DVD. On the screen, the Upa riding Kakadu's shoulder is screaming something unintelligible. It's like Pokemon. <laughs> I wish I had an Upa. Uh... Look at her sitting there all spaced out. Mayeti needs my protection. That dream was wrong. You're not wrong, she does need to be protected. But still, what the heck was that? I chug a Dr. P and check my phone. No new emails. I sent Titter a mail several hours ago, just to make sure that he really isn't Suzuha's father. He hasn't replied yet. Obviously, Daru and the others don't know that I changed the past. Oh, Faris, what? Hello? This is Hawawin Kiyoma. Nyan! It's Faris Nyan! Oh, it's you, Akeha Rumiho. Nya? Who's that, Nya? Hmm? I could have sworn her real name was Akiha Rumiho. Don't tell me. Could the D mail have changed that too? Faris is Faris, Nya. I don't have any other names, Nya. Yeah, right. Your true name is Faris. My apologies. Of course, she's just being her usual self. Well. What is it? If Faris is calling me, it might be about the IBN 5100. She did promise to help us find one. You've been too conspicuous, Nya. The cat's out of the bag, and now you're trapped, Nya. What? Huh? More of Faris's usual nonsense? 
The four guardian kings have awakened, Nya. There's no escape, Nyan. <laughs> Is that so? If you think the four guardian kings can stop me, just wait and see. Akaba will be drowning in blood before nightfall. After the four guardian kings are the four guardian queens, Nya. After that, it's the eight devils. And then, the black angel twelve, Nya. Th that many? What's going on in this town? <laughs> You've really stirred up a hornet's nest, Nya. I'm sorry, Kyoma, but this is checkmate, Nyan. No, it's not over yet. If I can just acquire the item, I can turn the tide. Have you still not located an IBN 5100? Sorry, Nya. I have agents looking all over the world, but still no luck, Nya. What, so she has no progress to report? Please hurry. I'm running out of time. Okay, Nya. I'll tell you as soon as I find one, Kyoma. Until then, hold on to your nine lives, Nya. Yeah, I can't die yet. Else I co- <laughs> She hung up before I could finish. Dang it. That's why I hate talking to Forrest. Anyway, moving on. This time around, my search for an IBN 5100 is going poorly. Actually, I suppose I should consider myself lucky for having found one so easily the first time. I mean, the IBN 5100 is practically an urban legend. There are people like Moeka who've spent months searching with no success. Yeah, I know, and then you let people change time and it screwed everything up! Ah! Anyway... Last time, it barely took me three days to reach Yanabayashi's shrine. Almost as if something was guiding me there. It was fate. No. It was the choice of Steins Gate. Or it was you from the future trying to get your, your younger self to the IBN 5100 somehow. Like... That's always a possibility. I, I, you would think when you mess with time, you would think of the possibilities that you've opened up other word lines and that's why you're here and... Uh, yeah. <sighs> I just... I don't know. That's why its loss is so painful. Guess that's why they call it the Phantom PC. Daru was sitting at his computer like always. I read on that channel that some collectors will pay millions of yen to buy one. IBN 5100s are serious business, man. If they have that high a premium, then people must know their secret. They're all after the data in CERN's mainframe. I don't get it. How come they're so expensive? I mean... I guess they were pretty expensive to begin with. Looks like one cost about $20,000 back in the day. $20,000? That is expensive. Anyway, I can't believe it's so hard to find one. Sure, it was a nice machine for its time, but only for its time. You'd have to be crazy to want one now. Maybe it's one guy buying them all up. The harder something is to obtain, the stronger the desire for it becomes. That's how people are. That is not incorrect. See, that's a smart statement. That's smart. Why is he not smart in other cases? Ugh. And that's exactly how I feel now. In the depths of CERN, completely isolated from the outside, lies a database coded with an IBN 5100. What secrets are sleeping there? Could it contain the data from CERN's time machine research? Could there be proof that the Committee of 300 exists? The desire to know grows stronger by the day. 
It's not just about plunging the world into chaos anymore. We need the power to oppose CERN's evil ambitions. And then there's that threatening email to consider. Daru is confident that CERN won't find us, but I can't afford to take that for granted. After all, we're up against the brightest minds in the world. The scientists who invented the World Wide Web. And they're backed by a secret organization more powerful than any nation. We're way out of our league here. They'd have no trouble at all crushing our puny lab if they desired. That's why we need a trump card to hold against them. But without an IBM 5100, we can't move forward. I'm getting restless. Whoa! What's this? Daru suddenly lurches forward to stare at his monitor. What's wrong? But... There's no way that's right! What are you talking about? Explain! Well, I'm pulling Dad off the server, looking for a way to gain root access. And these files are downloading crazy fast. I mean, we're talking light speed here. It's hard to believe, but for some reason, this area has a direct fiber optic line to CERN. Several lines, even. Direct? What do you mean? I mean, there's literally a fiber optic cable running from underneath this building to CERN's headquarters in France. Oh, crap! Is that strange? Yeah, it's strange! Uh, yeah? Daru calls up the National Assembly of France's website. Hold on. So this must mean that we had to get access to CERN and we knew that we were going to. So did we like retroactively like in the future have someone be contracted when this building was first made or when they were adding cables to it to have a cable that goes directly from this like Wi-Fi all the way to France? How is that even possible, by the way? But also, like, did we do that? Did we have that happen? What the heck? Then he brings up the command prompt and hammers out some commands. Have a look. This is the route we used to visit the National Assembly of France's site. It starts from our IP address. From there, it passes through various re relays in Japan, jumps to France. Okay, so it's... okay. Then bounces around for a while uh, before finally reaching the National Assembly site. It takes 16 steps total to get there. The average transfer rate is about 300 milliseconds. That's normal for an overseas co connection. In other words, there's a route we have to take to get to France from Japan. Everyone takes the same route. Other countries are the same. Even browsing domestically takes about 10 steps. Now let's try CERN. Daru calls up CERN's homepage on the browser. Then he displays the route like last time. The result? There's only one step. Unlike before, the signal doesn't pass through any intermediate servers. Oh, so he was showing what it was supposed to be like. Got you. The PC we're using, its registered name is Akehibara PC, is connected directly to CERN in France. And the transfer rate is hundreds of times better than usual. Crazy fast! You can't even get these numbers domestically, man. Why do we have a direct line? Is this even possible? It was like this when we found it. I didn't do anything. So the building already had a hotline to CERN? This can't be a coincidence. 
It might just be the choice of stu- It doesn't make sense. Why would there be an independent line running from here all the way to CERN? Daru's so excited, he interrupted me. No Japanese or French telecommunication company would set up something like this. Which means... CERN did it themselves. Daru gulps and nods. Cold sweat oozes from his brow. Wait a minute. If that's true, if, if they actually did it themselves, when they're saying we're watching you, did they go back in time to set that up so that it would be set up with a line directly connected to, this, to us so that they could watch us? Is that what that meant? Was it actually certain that even send that? Oh man, there's a lot of questions suddenly coming up. I feel a chill as well. CERN might be able to see everything we're doing. No. Maybe... Maybe CERN has been expecting us for years. How could that be? The answer is simple. John Titter claims that CERN completed their time machine in 2034. Just two years later, the world is a dystopia under their rule. Maybe the CERN of 2034 considers our opposition in 2010 a threat. Maybe they used their time machine to travel to 2000 and install a fiber optic cable to track our every move. See, that's what I was thinking. So, that means it's probably not right, right? Because he's thinking of it as well? I don't know. It's entirely possible. Has the invention of the time machine started an inter intertemporal war? If so, what can we do? Our enemy might be stronger than even I can imagine. No, I mustn't lose heart. I need to think positive. But thanks to this direct line, we can now control the LHC remotely. What if they want us to do this? I have a feeling we set it up for ourselves, but anyway, whatever. You figured out how? Wow, that's amazing, Daruku. Mayeri pauses her DVD and comes up beside me. With a connection this fast, we can control the LHC practically in real time. I haven't actually tried it yet, though. That's right. Even if this is some kind of CERN trap, we might be able to make use of it. They're still vulnerable to our attack. That's not the best way to look at it, my guy. The LHC is that 20 kilometer long tunnel thing, right? Um, um, what does it do again? It accelerates protons and smashes them together. Oh yeah, mini black holes, right? The official line is that mini black holes might manifest as a byproduct of the particle collision, but that's not the truth. According to the top secret documents we found, the LHC was intended to create black holes from the very beginning. But we still don't know exactly how they do it. We need to think of a way to... Okabe. Kuritsu suddenly emerges from the development room. She was cooped up in there all morning. Her expression is unusually grave. What's wrong? I figured it out. Figured what out? I think I know how the phone wave works. Really? Kuritsu nods. She still hasn't smiled. Keep in mind that this is just a hypothesis based on what we've observed. It's closely related to what you guys were just talking about. The LHC. I believe it was you, Christina, who called the LHC the world's largest microwave? Yes. Exactly. My hunch was right. You've created a monster, Okabe. A monster? 
It doesn't belong in some amateur lab. And before you take that as an endorsement of your abilities, I mean it in a bad way. Kuritsu clutches her arms as if to keep them from trembling. Give me details. Did you know that the microwave oven was intended as a byproduct of radar research? Daru and I nod. Mayuri shakes her head. <laughs> we read up on all that back then. The phone wave name subject to change started acting weird. Microwaves are electromagnetic waves with a frequency of 2.45 gigahertz. The phone wave is commercial grade, so its output is around 1500 to 2000 watts. Here's the important part. Kuritsu goes on to explain that the electromagnetic waves output by the microwave are somehow connected to the electromagnetic waves output by the phone. In fact, you could say they fuse together. So basically like smashing protons together, is that what he's getting at? According to Daru's blueprints, the microwave and the phone are made to send out shared electromagnetic waves by taking their leads. And hardwiring each of them to the uh, magnetrons cathode and anode. On one hand, we have the microwave's super strong electromagnetic waves, originally a byproduct of the military's research into radar technology. On the other, we have the cell phone's standardized electromagnetic waves, a frequency now ubiquitous throughout the world. What happens when you fuse those two waves? Both devices use electromagnetic waves. I'm not a specialist though, so I can examine the extent of magnitude of the influence that fusion has. But hypothetically, if the cell phone were to become a stepping stone, scattering the military-grade electromagnetic waves over a vast range of hundreds of kilometers, then not just Akihabara, but all of Tokyo would turn in into the inside of a microwave oven. Oh, shoot. Taking into account slight variances due to body weight, the average time until death for the people inside would be... three minutes. Three minutes. I feel like that's... I feel like something else was three minutes that we did. What, what am I thinking of? I feel like there was something else that we did that also had to do with three minutes. I'll have to just wait for now because I can't remember, but I feel like... Uh, anyway. Eh? Seriously? Then the phone wave's a weapon of mass destruction, isn't it? It... Is it really that powerful? Let me tell you what happens inside the phone wave. The air inside the oven is full of invisible hydrogen atoms. First, it bombards the atoms with microwaves to increase their energy potential. This is the normal function of a microwave oven. But when you add the electromagnetic waves from the phone, the harmonics trigger a chain reaction. The particles collide repeatedly at near light speed, gaining mass and energy each time. In other words, it becomes a sort of particle accelerator. Oh. A particle accelerator? It's literally the same as the LHC. So, if the LHC was created to generate many black holes, then the phone wave name subject to change must also produce many black holes. Kuritsu doesn't deny it. It's a miracle that that thing has been so stable. But there's still one thing I don't understand. Even if it does produce many black holes, they should evaporate instantly. But that's not what happens in the phone wave. The jellification phenomenon proves that. 
just like in the LHC, our many black holes are turning into Kerr black holes. According to Titter, you have to inject electrons to produce the Kerr black hole effect. Where did the injected electrons come from? That's what I don't understand. The LHC uses something called a lifter to inject electrons into the black hole and control the gravitational field. Something is filling that role inside the phone wave. S something? Is it the... Uh... Oh, it's, it's... I wonder if it's the, um... I wonder if it's the, uh, the turntable in there. Because remember they said it, doesn't it go backwards? You see it, we get to actually see the turntable go backwards? I bet that's the lifter. Like I said, I don't know what. So I guess that's what it comes down to. All Kiritsu's explanation does is confirm our hypothesis that the phone wave name subject to change functions the same as the LHC. Looks like we need to review what the LHC is. Uh. Part-time warrior, oneself. It's easy to pretend to be someone you're not. Ultimately, however, there's no escaping the contradictions between your false self and the real you. It's a paradox, and paradoxes can't hold... I tried to tell myself that I didn't need anyone, that forming bonds would only hurt, but somehow I ended up joining your circle of friends. I still don't know if it was for the best. No, I'm sure it was. Without you, I would have given up on ever finding my dad. I don't know why I wrote all this. I guess what I'm trying to say is thanks. Aw. Dude. Suzuha's like quickly gaining on my favorite in this list. I mean, I don't think anyone can surpass Mayuri, but she's going to come in at like either a hot second or like a real close hot third because I kind of like Kuritsu a lot too, so I don't know. False self. So she was just. Is she starting to open up? Because she's starting to act a little bit more friendly now, right? Are we sharing confessions now? Be careful to whom you expose your innermost feelings. They may use them against you. Well, that's not what I want to send, but it's the only thing I can send. It's time for our LHC Moe guy to shine. LHC stands for Large Hadron Collider. Hadron? It's the name of an elementary particle. The LHC is basically a huge circular tunnel underneath Switzerland and France. It sits about 100 meters below ground and has a total length of 27 kilometers. There are two rings that run through the tunnel. Inside the rings is a super low temperature vacuum, an environment like our like outer space, basically. Seriously, Moe. In an adjacent facility, protons are gradually accelerated by the linear accelerator, the proton synchrotron booster, and the super proton synchrotron synchrotron. Finally, they're injected into the LHC, where they undergo their final acceleration via a seri series of superconducting magnets installed in the tunnel. By now, they're traveling at up to 99.9999991% the speed of light. That's enough to melt your brain. Not as dangerous as the phone wave, though. Finally, the accelerated protons collide approximately 1 to one, uh, 10 billion times per second. The 
the purpose of the LHC project is to study the high energy reactions that result. Or so they say. We know they're a bunch of stinking liars. I guess that about covers it. And that, my fellow lab members, brings us to the question. Can the phone wave name subject to change beat CERN so uh, to true f uh, physical time travel? Two problems. One, setting the destination. Two, the lifter. We've already established that the D-mail arrives precisely when and where it's supposed to. It's dangerous to accept that without verification. Agreed. As for the lifter, we already know it's it exists. We just need to figure out what it is. It's got to be that turntable. I don't think we're going to find it. The phone wave's not exactly big, you know. And we've been poking at it for days without turning up a clue. Even if we do find it, It'll take forever to learn how to tune the electron feed properly. How long is forever? CERN's been working on it for nine years and they still haven't solved it. We're just amateurs, so it's bound to take even longer. Wait. I have an idea. Let's look at it from a different angle. CERN tried to send people back in time, but they couldn't get the electron feed right. The singularities were not naked. It's the same with the phone wave name subject to change. You can only send 36 bytes of data safely. Otherwise, you get a jelly man. Let's consider the problem in reverse. What if we could convert a human to data? then compress that data into just 36 bytes. We could send that person through the ring singularity just like a D-mail, couldn't we? Convert a human to data? That's not even possible, man. And even if it were, there'd be like exabytes of data or something. You want to compress that into 36 bytes? Are you high? Hmm. I thought it was a good idea. <laughs> I guess it's not that easy. The barriers to time travel are just too high. I turned to Kiritsu, meaning to ask her opinion, and then I realized that her expression has changed dramatically. Her eyes are wide as saucers, and her mouth is hanging open. Of course. If it works, then maybe... She pauses for a sec second, and then... Maybe we can do it! Do what? Time travel? It's hard to believe what Kiritsu is saying, even though it was my idea in, in the first place. Are you serious? Kiritsu grins triumphantly in response. The data compression part, at least, is easy. We can just use the black holes created by the LHC, since black holes compress everything they swallow. Compression won't harm data like it, it would harm a human. As long as we're just sending data, there's nothing to worry about. I get it! But wait, can we really pull off such a stunt? I still don't get it. <laughs> and besides, how do you plan to convert humans into data? That's what I'm trying to figure out. You know that my thesis got published, right? This is no time to flaunt your accomplishments. <laughs> Have you read it? I haven't. <laughs> I've got scans if you want to read it. Daru opens up his image folder, scrolls past tons of 2D porn, and opens up the scanned image. Sure enough, there's Kiritsu's name in big English letters. The title of my thesis is... 
analysis of memory-related nerve impulses in the temporal lobe. Oh, she's going to send memory into into time. Is that how we're doing this? So she's sen sending, like, uh, uh, the... I, I bet she's going to send, like, the... Uh, what is it? The elect... Because our... Uh, uh, our brain waves are like electro waves or something like that, right? I forget what the technical term is. It's not electromagnetic, I don't think. Well, let's just use that term just because I can't think of the actual word in, in, if it's not. Um, our brain uses electromagnetic waves to send information to the rest of our body to tell it what to do, right? So is she going to try to like hook us up to something and send those those like uh, brain waves and that's how we'll time travel? Curious now. Temporal lobe? Nerve impulses? What? You didn't know? No, wait. This can't be right. This title sounds like, um, neuroscience, not physics. I'm a neuroscientist. Got a problem? What? I can't believe it. From the way she talks about particle accelerators and time travel theory, I was sure she had to be a physicist. Oh, shoot, okay. No, forget about that. How is this related to time travel? Converting an entire human to data is impossible. But converting a human's memories may be possible. Converting memories to data? Keritsu proceeds to explain her thesis. Memories accumulate in something called the parahippocampal uh, gyrus, I think, or hippocampus, which is located in the temporal lobe of the brain. But what exactly are memories? Keritsu's thesis analyzes that question from a neuroscientific perspective. All of the brain's functions manifest as electrical signals. Okay, so electrical signals, not electromagnetic. Running through its neurons. Even memories are written to the hippocampus by electrical signals. Kuritsu analyzed how specific electrical signals correspond to specific memories. The mechanism by which humans recall memories can be likened to a word association game. You begin with a vague abstract image which calls successive images of increasing clarity. That makes sense. Imagine a box of drawers. Each drawer is filled with tiny boxes, and inside each box is another bunch of tiny boxes. You keep opening boxes until you find the memory you're looking for. Kuritsu discovered that the number of uh, retrieval commands, nerve impulses used to search up memories, is surprisingly low. Out of hundreds of millions of nerve impulse patterns in the brain, only a few thousand are related to memory. That's interesting. I see where this is going. It was the successful analysis of these patterns that earned Kuritsu and her research team critical acclaim in the scientific community. Interesting. Now, before you ask how this relates to time travel, there's one more thing I need to explain. Several years ago, my lab, the Neuropsychology Lab at Victor Condoria University, developed a technology called Visual Rebuilding, or VR for short. Excuse me, VR is uh, virtual reality? Put simply, it enables conversion of video data into nerve impulse signals. Used in reverse, it can also convert nerve impulses into video data, or any other kind of electronic data. Interesting. So if we combine VR technology with my research, do you see where I'm going? No way. We can convert memories into data? Not just that. Memory transplantation, backups, external storage, all of those things become possible. It's like science fiction. 
in a sense, this technology could be used to copy a person's soul. Oh, great. Now we're getting into, like, robot stuff. Like, almost AI. Oh, boy. Okay. This is getting... Oh, boy. Okay. I can't even talk right now. I, I'm just so blown away by all this information. Um, According to Kuritsu, some religious groups strongly oppose this research, as you might expect. Yeah, and same for me. I don't know if it's cool to, like, try to copy someone's soul. I mean, it probably wouldn't be them, right? Like, it... Your memories don't constitute who you are, your, your, your soul does, so your memories would just be like recorded data of who you were. Isn't that how that would work? Because they're memories, right? They're, they're things that happened in the past that you experienced that you recorded, just like this video, basically. So it'd be no different. So it's not really the actual person, just their memories. Which I suppose then you could compile those memories and create an AI out of it, but it's not really their soul. It's not really them, right? I mean, that's how that works. That's always been my reasoning behind people who try to say, like, you know, robots are people. It's like, well, not really, because the thing that makes you a person is your spirit. So, anyway. On the other hand, the medical community is ecstatic about the possibility possibilities. In any case, it's amazing that my assistant here was able to make such an incredible discovery. Of course... She did have a university supporting her, but still. So, basically, what you're saying is that we convert the subject's memories into video data. Use the LHC's black hole to compress that data into 36 bytes. Send that data through the Kerr black hole inside the phone wave name subject to change. And finally, imprint those memories on the subject's brain in the past. What does that mean? Okay, that makes more sense. So, it is still just data, but they're so but it limits you, right? So you can't go like extremely far into the future and you can't go extremely far into the past. You could only go as far as you're alive. So what happens if you try to send that data to, to when you're already dead, does it just disappear? It just kind of fades into existence? Like, uh, or out of existence, I guess? That's interesting. It's still So this still isn't like a true, true time machine, but it's a form of a time machine. Interesting. It could basically just give you insight to, to be able to maybe not make mistakes in the past, potentially. That's always a possibility. So you could imprint what you know now, put it on your young self when you're like five or whatever, and then be like, you know, how you know, like a 70-year-old, let's say if you imprinted a 70-year-old, you'd have the brain of a 70-year-old and the body of a five-year-old, and you could just keep compiling that information, just keep copying it over and over and over and over. Wow, that's that's still really cool. Not a true time machine, but it's a form of some kind of time travel, it's a step further anyway. We can send our memories back in time. In order to differentiate it from physical time travel, let's call it time leap for now. You don't go back, just your memories. It's so crazy that nobody's thought of it before. She's right. The idea is ridiculous, which is exactly why none of the geniuses at CERN could come up with it. But this union of physics, neuroscience, and neuropsychology will make the impossible possible. To transfer memories to the past via cell phone. To time leap. The important thing to remember is that only memories are being transferred. Personality and consciousness aren't included. What does that mean? How is it different from what you see in sci-fi novels? Time leaping in sci-fi usually sends everything. Consciousness, personality, and memory. But in real life, there's probably too much data. And besides, we only analyzed memories. That's true, so you could just get like, when you're like 10 years old, just get 
just flashed with all this sudden like crap that you know half is gonna be happening or something but you would be thinking it happened in the past until you realize oh crap i'm 10 years old again oh man that's gonna happen in the future like that would just be like an assault on your senses i feel like that would just be like a complete assault on your brain that would be crazy i wonder if that's why when we just changed time again i believe it was last episode that he said my brain is, what do you say, flickering or something? He said his brain was doing something. So it's like, I wonder if he was feeling whatever that phenomenon is. Interesting. Think of consciousness, personality, and memory as separate things. Memories are like the video data stored on your computer. And consciousness and personality are like the OS. But videos can take up way more space than, in, than the OS. It's just an example. For starters, it's still not clear where personality and consciousness are located, or how they are constructed. So we can't convert them into data. Or at least I can't. So we can only send memories. Where does that leave us? Your memories aren't the only thing that define you. Even if you send your memories to the past, it will be the receiving you's consciousness and personality that process them. Interesting. So that could, that could lead to bad things happening. So in Mindor's terms, it's like copying data from a Vista computer to a... Uh, what is that? I'm, I'm assuming that's supposed to be Windows 95 computer. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, I guess this would be... I guess Vista would be, like, the best computer during that time. Or, like, one of them. Crap, yeah, because this, this is this game was 2009, technically, when it came out. I had a Windows Vista back in... It was, like, a 2007 model. So, yeah, I guess I would be the best one at the time. That's crazy. Wow. Okay. Data created with the latest OS might work... Might not work on an older OS. It might cause errors. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, right? It would just overload your brain. Like, it's almost like... So think of it like this, right? Your brain has to has to have the information stored on there, like, slowly, right? Like, you, you gain one memory at a time. But if you just gain all these memories all at once, that'd be like attacking your hippocampus, right? It would just, like, be writing all of this information onto your brain all at once... I mean, that could probably give you, like, an aneurysm or something, right? It'd be like, you're creating multiple wrinkles, probably. You're probably, like, sending a bunch of electric signals directly to your brain all at once. Like, all the electric signals that you've had up to that point in your life, but at a time in your life that's, like, maybe 10, 20 years earlier. That, yeah, that could totally just destroy you. That's crazy. For example... If you sent your current memories to yourself in elementary school, the gap between your memories and your body could have serious consequences. Anyway, is it correct to assume that we'll be targeting ourselves in the past? That was pertinent information. You don't skate over that. Excuse me? That's necessary to know. Because, like, could you... I mean, we're not creating paradoxes again. I have to keep remembering that because of the world line thing. But, like, that could have issues, right? Because when you have the knowledge of your future self, but you're in the past, you won't, you, you might avoid the mistakes that you made because you know that you made them. Which then, how does the, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how this works anymore. Everything's so confusing. Kiritsu nods at my question. Just like with D-mail, we're using cell phones as the transfer medium. To be precise, you can only leap into your own body, and only if you had a cell phone at the time of reception. There was an exception in Lukaku's case where we sent a d-mail to a pager, but that doesn't apply to time leaping. If you try sending memories to someone else, um, how do I put this? There's a danger that the electrical signals might be rejected. Oh, rejected? I was thinking that it would overwhelm, so what does that mean? 
wouldn't want to jump into someone else's body. I mean, unless it's the body of a cute girl. <laughs> Is this guy capable of a non-perverted thought? <laughs> Don't <laughs> me, you idiot. If it just bounces off, that's fine, but I'm worried incompatible memory data might do serious damage to the recipient's psyche. That's a good point. So you better hope that it goes into the correct data storage, I guess you would call it at that point or whatever, right? You better hope it goes into the right computer. Oh no. We're gonna end up in somebody's body. What if that's why- <gasps> What if that's why Kiritsu kills herself? What if, like, what if we accidentally end up inside her brain and it makes her go crazy and she, she like, kills herself or something? <gasps> oh, that's just a theory. I don't think it's a good one, but it's a theory. That's crazy. <laughs> I don't know what might happen. No one's done it before, after all. That makes us pioneers. I like it. Oh, boy. There are two things I don't know. One, you definitely cannot go back before you were born. And two, you won't exist in two places at once. That means you don't have to worry about causing a paradox. You can't kill your parents before you were born. Right. But you could still have the paradox of actually... You, it may not make you disappear, but you could make things that you did disappear. Which could... I guess... Okay, but here's the thing, though. If we... If we pull, um, I was going to say a Marty McFly, but I don't think it's from Back to the Future. I, was, I, I can't remember where I heard it from. But if you went back in time and then you change something that eventually happens, but you didn't, you didn't go back in time with the purpose of doing so, you could still change time. I, if I remember correctly. But if you go back with the intention of changing that thing, that thing hasn't happened yet. Well, no, but see, so we're, we're still, we're copying that data. So I guess it does kind of get rid of the paradox, actually. Because what I was going to say was you would go back in time, but but you, would, you wouldn't you would know that you were wanting to change that thing until the future. So it would create like this paradox. I think I said that right. So that, that way it just wouldn't happen. I, I think just time travel just wouldn't happen. It would cancel itself out. Um... Anyway, maybe I don't know what I'm talking about, but let's keep going. So the phones act like black and white holes. It seems like a strange coincidence that cell phones would be the medium of, of time travel, but really, could it have been anything else? These days, people wear their phones like a second skin. No other medium could reliably deliver the memories to their intended target. The more I think about it, the more I realize that this was meant to be. <laughs> I whip out my phone and place it to my ear. It's me. Everything is falling into place. The plan can now proceed to the final stage. I'm talking about Operation Verth... Verthandi, obviously. <laughs> Christina had me fooled. I never knew she was capable of this. It must have been the choice of Steinsgate that sent her here. Don't worry. I have everything under control. Nothing can stop us now. Elsai Kongru. I put away my phone and turned to Kuritsu. Were you listening? Good. Commence preparations for Operation Verthendi. First, explain what that is. We're going to build your time leap machine, Christina. And you'd better not say it can't be done. Not after showing me the way. Well, this is Akehibara. I should be able to find the parts I need. Yeah, now that we changed everything. Then it's decided. I'm placing you in charge of this operation. 
Whatever you need, ask and it shall be yours. Together, we shall complete the first Time Leap machine in human history! Kiritsu nods. Her eyes are shining with a fierce, hungry light. As I thought, she's a scientist to the core. Kiritsu and Daru go home, leaving me with Mayuri. I thought she was hard at work on her costume, but when I look, I find her staring at the wall. Her hands have stopped moving. Mayuri? You're not going home? She usually doesn't stay this late. Her parents might be worried. Um, I was thinking about what Okarin and Chris Chan were talking about earlier. I was trying to figure out what the things you said meant, but it was all so complicated, I didn't get any of it. <laughs> the only thing I get is that something amazing is gonna happen. Indeed, the world is about to change, and we shall be the ones to lead humanity into the future. You're shining, Okarin. Shining? <laughs> what does that mean? You're shining Christian too. Like two bright stars in the sky. That must be my aura of madness you're sensing. <laughs> you know, it's been ten days since Christian joined us. Can I tell you how I've been feeling? Yes, yes, tell us. Since Chris Chan became a lab mem, it feels like things have really started to happen. Like we're a real lab now, you know? Huh. <laughs> I must admit, her knowledge has been a great asset. Of course, the girl genius would never have joined us if not for the cunning of Haowen Kiyoma. <laughs> That's why you're shining so bright now, Okari. Chris-chan is really a big help to you, I know. But I can't do anything to help. No, no! Don't, don't be mean to yourself. Don't bully yourself. I can't get mad at you. Just say stop bullying yourself. Don't do it. Mayuri looks depressed. No, no. I wish I were smart too. Then maybe I could help. No! Oh. Mayuri. She's never expressed such sentiments before. Is she jealous of Kuritsu's talents? Is there competition brewing in the lab? I sigh and walk to the window. I can't see many stars in the sky. Mayuri, aren't you going to look at the stars? Mayuri comes up beside me. We lean out the window together. Aww. It's only 9pm, but Akaba is already still and silent, save for the occasional car trundling by. Trundling? <laughs> Back when the lab just started, before Darukun joined, it was... Like this a lot, wasn't it? All quiet. Just the two of us. Yeah. It was. Daru joined the lab in early May. Before that, he was unwilling to join no matter how I tried to convince him. Then he learned that the lab was just three minutes away from May Queen plus Neon to the second power, and suddenly he was all future gadget laboratory. Heck yeah! But for about a month and a half after the lab's founding, it was just me and Mayuri all, all alone. Can Mayushi stay here? Is it really okay? Oh, you, of course you can! Of course you can stay here! No one said you, could, you had to leave! What do you mean? We freaking have Luca in here, and, and she doesn't freaking contribute anything. <laughs> so 
So it's fine. You make people happy and you give them juicy chicken number one. It's fine. Don't. Mayuri looks at me with uncertainty in her eyes. I meet her gaze firmly, then bop her lightly on the head. Don't be ridiculous. All you need to do is stay. Just stay? Without you, the lab would be a much less friendly place. That's what I'm saying! All right, let's go! Let's go, Okabe! Freaking coming in clutch for once in your life, not being stupid! He's right! You see how Kiritsu and I argue. We can be pretty stubborn, and sometimes we don't know when to stop. But when it starts to get out of hand, Meiyori... You're always there with some ditzy, irrelevant comment to break the tension. Dude! How are you gonna backhand compliment her like that? Um, are you praising me? Of course I am. Don't worry about a thing. Just know that you too are part of my plan. <laughs> Okay. Thanks, Okari. Mayuri smiles in relief. And then her stomach rumbles. <laughs> I'm starving. I'll warm up some canned Odin. You want some too? Yeah. Heat it up. Coming right up. Aw, dude. Soon. We are chowing down on piping hot Odin. <laughs>